when your awareness is raised, this is emotional intelligence construct. And the most, the greatest challenge we as Americans have, or Western civilization, is that we've been conditioned to be numbed and then entertained, and then numbed and then entertained. All from outside in. Yet healing, happiness, well-being, intra and interpersonal relationships come from inside out. Therefore, when we see things that we didn't see before, we call that invisible. And lots of times when we go through these types of ideas, all of a sudden we walk out the door and a, whole, and a conversation is wholly different now than it ever was yesterday or 10 minutes ago because we did not see that aspect that we've become numb to. So just a quick story, um, Christmas time always is an interesting time frame for anyone because family gets together. And my, my comment about family get-togethers, it's a petri dish of dysfunctional behavior. If you sit there and treat it that way. Too often we go into the families of origin and we become normed to the dysfunctions and so we don't see them. So my, sister, my daughter-in-law was with me and she's been resistant to the, this type of material because one, I'm her father-in-law. <laughs> That's just the way the game played, right? But I gave her and her husband a, a challenge. They were going over for a New Year's Eve party, and we simply took the rules of engagement, which are right here, and they're in your, your books, your model books, and I said, all I want you to do is don't say a thing, but be aware. Pay attention to, is your space filled with safety, or are there these 10 areas? Do you feel free to be authentic tonight? And then do you feel hurt? So we'll cover that just a little bit. Well, I just got the, the awareness journal yesterday. We spent about a 90-minute debrief on New Year's Eve. And she sees her family different. She sees the conversations different. Her awareness has increased. And now, all of a sudden, husband and wife are talking to each other about things that they couldn't talk about before they came up to Washington because they'd get in a fight. And now, all of a sudden we can talk about something that heretofore would have fragmented us. Those of you who have been here before, you know what that means. Okay, so her awareness was raised, so she saw things she never saw before. And it doesn't mean it was easy. And it doesn't mean it was a great experience. It simply means she never saw them before. It's like walking, waking up uh, like Rumpelstiltskin, walking to the mirror and realizing you're now 100 years old instead of 10, 15. What an amazing experience if you can recognize something you're doing or you're doing that you never knew you were doing and the ripple effect of the impact having on other people is very paramount. But what if you never saw that? How can you change your behavior if you don't know what you're doing is having the exact opposite impact that you wanted it to have? You will also see or hear the unheard words, the way they say it. How they, how they phrase the words, and then sometimes body language, just as a side note. Um, according to all the researchers, there's three ways that we, especially the Western world, communicates. What are the three ways we communicate? Verbal, written, and body. Let me reframe the question. <laughs> That's a great answer. Let me just see if I can reframe it right. When I, if I were to have a conversation with Ben, there are three ways that you will try to understand what I'm saying, and I will try to understand what you're saying. What are those three ways? Expressions. Okay, so body language. Okay? Tone. Intonation. Natural. And the actual words. Okay. So body language, intonation, and words. On 100%, so 100% scale, how much do you think the body language would have? 80. 80? 45. 45. I know you're, yeah, it just, go off what you think it would be. 90. Would you go get him, tell him to come in? He's <laughs> standing up there freezing. We can put him right here. If everyone would just move down one, that would be great. Thank you. Just one chair. Okay, then if we're up to, from 45 to 80 on body language, what's our intonation going to be? Um, okay, 3%? 30. 20, 30, okay. Now, the only thing we have left is words. 
One. One percent. That is very funny. Okay. Body language is 55. So we communicate, and this is subconscious, by the way. We'll be chatting with each other. And 55% of the way you receive the message, Leo, you and I are chatting. Right. We will measure each other's by 55% of our body language. Which means, if you're communicating via text, or you're on the phone, what's happening? Zero. You lost 55% of the way you normally communicate, right? Because you're wow. used to, you're conditioned to, you're norm to, yeah. picking up 55% of, okay, am I like this, am I like this, am I like this? I once got chewed out by my boss who was East German because I walked around like this and I was talking to a client like this. He lit into me, oh my goodness. <laughs> I won't tell you what I said because I ended up losing my job. Um, okay, 30, <laughs> intonation, 38%. So I inflect up, I inflect down, I don't inflect, whatever it might be. Um, so have you ever listened to, and I'm going to stereotype, but it's typically this way, a female communicating with a young primary age person and trying to get a point across. <coughs> How does she normally intone her voice? Hi, Hi right? Have you heard humans talk to dogs? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's embarrassing. It just is. Watching a human talk sing songy to a dog as though the dog's actually understanding like a four-year-old would understand it's just hilarious but we all do it including yours truly and i don't like it when i talk to a dog that way because i feel really stupid when i'm aware of what i'm doing okay now 55 percent body language 38 percent intonation leaves seven percent for words and just imagine <clears throat> One of the greatest discoveries of mankind is the alphabet. And we use 7% of the way we communicate just listening to your words. That's why someone can say, Brian, I'm sorry. And someone can say, no, you're not. <laughs> you don't really mean that. You don't sound like you're really sorry. And you don't look it either. How many of us have done that or experienced that? Don't raise the rhetorical question. Isn't that amazing? So Dr. Gottman and Dr. Lund, years and years ago, took this research and they said, what can we do with this? How can we improve our abilities to communicate? And I, I actually heard this straight from Dr. Lund. They said they could communicate effectively 98.5% of the time. So I'm going to stop real quick before I finish it with another story. I, I do this game. It's called There's Not Enough Ice Cream. It's about a two and a half hour game. It's intense. There's usually tears shed, lots of laughter. And the whole purpose of the evening is for someone to stand here and say, there is not enough ice cream. And for those who are listening to determine what the emotion is. So I just eliminated 55, no body language. You have to stand here. You can only intone and you're saying the exact same words each time. There is not enough ice cream. And there's 12 emotions to choose from. And you, sitting there, will miss it more than 50% of the time. It is an absolute controlled scenario. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that if you have children, coworkers, or friends, significant others, or spouses, you will probably miscommunicate more than 50% of the time on a day-to-day -day basis if you use intonation and body language as part of your repertoire. Because Dr. Lund and Dr. Gottman discovered that you will be correct 98.5% of the time if you only use words. And the time you will be wrong is because you will interpret the words differently. It will be a semantic misunderstanding. So in our home, if you were to be a bug on the wall and watch my wife and I have an argument, which we do have, they're most enjoyable. I highly recommend having them like we do. But when we really get intense, one of us two will simply look at the other and say, Just listen to my words, don't read my body language, and don't go by intonation. This is what my words said. This is what I want them to mean. Nothing more than that. And if you know what you're doing, if you're doing this with each other and you both agree to communicate with words, it just eliminates all the emotion. Because I will go, no, that's not what you meant. Rich, just the word. 
Thanks. Okay, so what you're saying, Sherry, is... Yeah. No way. <laughs> it can't be. Because of my immaculate perception, I will try to distort her because I have a belief bias that she has to offend me. And right now, I need my drugs to be offended, don't I? How many of us have absolutely sabotaged a, a conversation or a relationship because we have to be drugged with our sabotaging mechanisms? All right. Is that why my favorite communications mechanism is the written word? Um, it's safer, right? Except if you're having an argument. How many of you have solved an argument by texting? That's a disaster. <laughs> why? Why is texting a disaster? Because you don't, if you don't punctuate correctly. They don't. Not know the rice it's, emoji. It's not right. You use the right emoji. Auto correct ruins it. Oh yeah, I had a really doozy the other day. Really <laughs> the other day. <laughs> my wife was trying to do that with Siri. She ended up f bombing my son. <laughs> Serious. My son will not erase it. <laughs> Just get rid of that. My wife. My wife has never said that word to my knowledge in her life. Okay. So it comes out that way. Siri interprets it. My son gets it. She goes, Mom, I'm saving this. <laughs> you know how parents will save pictures compromising their children? He's got my wife. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, the reason why it's so difficult is because, let's say I know you fairly good, or even if I don't, and you, you text me a message, will I not instantly? install my own emoticon, emotions, intonations inside the text based upon what my belief bias is. Oh, yes. That's why texting is so challenging. Written word can work if you have a chance, if the person who's reading it is to read it for the words themselves. But how many of you actually hear your voice when you read? Therefore, could you not inflect within the voice? I've, there are certain people I know so well, when I read them, I can hear their voice, right? Well, can you not then actually see them in your mind's eye? I can see them saying that. Therefore, we're already putting in the 55% and the 38% in so doing. The challenge that I'm giving you now is to really work on words only. Not only from yourself, so when the words come out, they've got to be, therefore, neutral. Because if they come out anything other than neutral, would it not be easy then to install or insert your own emoticon of their intonation? And we'll be covering that tonight. Okay, that was another thing that would be invisible or unheard. What is it that we're not seeing, understanding, or hearing when people communicate with us? Because we have a belief bias. We automatically assume, I mean, okay, here's another one. Again, Pamela, you're just sitting here, so I'm going to chat with you a lot tonight. So you and I are chatting. How many of you automatically go, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. You think you already know what they're going to say. And then you finish the sentence. Nothing drives me nuttier than someone finishing my sentences. Just, it just shuts me right down. Because they don't know. They don't know what I'm feeling like. So those of you who've read my book, um, and you heard me speak, this is sensitive to me. It's very sacred to me. But I'm telling you because it means something. At age 10, I lost my father in a war. By age 12, I didn't tell it. I only told five people from age 12 to 50 that I lost my father in a war. On one hand, I can count how many people I told, voluntarily told, that my father was killed in a war. Why? Because from 10 to 12, I was so traumatized by every adult who ran across me telling me that they know what I'm going through and how I should behave and how I should feel and when it's going to stop, the pain's going to stop that I didn't trust telling anyone something so sacred as my father passed away. So I didn't. And then so I researched it. I want to know why. And I started being aware of other people doing it. And then I got a phone call one day, and it was from um, a woman whose kids grew up with me. His, their father was a Marine like my dad, and he was a, a sergeant. He was about as high as he could go. And then he died of cancer. And so the mother calls me up and she said, would you please call my boys? They'll listen to you and, and just talk to them. Their dad's just passed away. There's two of them, just like my brother and me. So I called him and we chatted. But what she said was that you'll be able to relate to them. You know what they're going through. And I said, Mrs. Frost, I don't know what they're going through. I know what I went through. But I do not know what they're going through. 
so I can listen to them, I'll, I'll hear what they have to say, and they'll have someone that they can say something to that's safe, but I can't relate to what they're going through. So here's another little tidbit. You guys, you don't know what someone else is going through unless they tell you. That's empathy. Everything else is relating, and relating, if you'll ever want to look over here to the rules of engagement and look at number four, it's called a communication <coughs> blind spot. When you relate to somebody, you just steal their thunder. You take away from them your presence. And now you're no longer paying attention. You're not paying attention. You're no longer present. 